And we're back with some more oxygen not included. And today we're just taking a quick look at the Fast Friends update. This is an update that dropped for the game just recently. And I just want to go over some of the changes because the biggest one that I've seen so far is to do with the ranching. This is, oh, this is so useful. It used to be the only way you could increase your husbandry skill was by hugging incubated eggs. That was it. However, now just doing the actual task of running a, a grooming station will slowly but surely increase the, groom, the husbandry skill of your duplicates. This has been a long time coming. This was a known bug for at least a year, if not two. So now that that's in place, that means you don't have to hire every single duplicate that comes along with plus 14 ranching. You can actually hire a low-end rancher and just train them up. Though I'm not too sure how quick it is just yet. It, like, I mean, it, you're going to be going to be playing long enough, they will let Max out. And next up, we're going to th go through all the critter morphs. There's a fair few of them, and I think I'll go through the one that's probably the least impactful, but also sort of the most fun. That's to do with the new Delectable. It's a, a shovel mutation. For example, when you have a, a shovel, 98% chance now, Delectable has a 2% chance, unless you keep the temperature of the shovel between 60 to 100 C. That's pretty easy to manage, to be honest. Then, you get yourself a Delectable. What have you got? Well, you've got a vole that drops half as much meat which is kind of annoying, but you can shear them, and when you shear them, they drop these things called tonic roots. Yeah, um, honestly, this is pretty weak sauce, but it's, it's sort of strong, but also additionally weak. Let me try and cover it. See, you can take those and combine them with nosh beans to make 5,000 calories worth of curried beans. This is actually incredibly powerful on the surface. The easiest way to explain it is to compare it to pepper bread. You see, nosh beans up until this point were almost useless. The reason nosh beans were so terrible is the moment you created them, the only thing you could make out of them was tofu, which required you to combine six units of them with water. Now, if you're not familiar with nosh beans, that's that's perfectly reasonable. You need to feed them ethanol to make them grow. You need to keep them in sub-zero conditions. They're, they're actually really painful to, well, semi-painful to make. And then when, what you get out of them is something that requires a bunch of water to turn it into a substandard food, at which point you have to combine that substandard food with pepper nuts to make an actual decent meal. You get 4,000 calories of spicy tofu, which has about the same food quality as pepper bread. In fact, it's pretty much the same as pepper bread, except slower, harder to make, and took more resources and time and effort. So it was basically pointless ever went with pepper bread or something else instead. Curried beans flips that. You get four units of nosh bean, and you get 5,000 calories. But then in perspective, the spicy tofu, that took six units of nosh bean to make, and it only gave you 4,000 calories. So it took 50% more nosh beans to make and didn't even give you as many calories. Yeah, also it requires a bunch of water as well to make. So curried beans is actually a massive upgrade. Just comparing the nosh bean consumption versus the pepper bread consumption to grow, say, the same amount of pepper bread, you would need about 1,350 kilos of water to feed 20 duplicates pepper bread. That's a lot of water, plus about 250 kilos of dirt uh, and some phosphorite. Curried beans, on the other hand, they require ethanol, so you're actually feeding the water to trees instead. So if you take it in terms of water you feed to trees, ends up you're only going to need about 235 kilos of water, as opposed to the 1,350 pepper red requires. You're also going to need about 36 kilos of dirt, which is, or wait, no, 176 kilos of dirt, which doesn't matter, you get dirt out of your ethanol creation devices anyway. So you're, these things are just so cheap, it's insane in terms of nosh beans. It actually makes nosh beans far more competitive than sweet wheat grain. Unfortunately, the tonic root is a problem. You see, the tonic root you get from these uh, delectopups or delectables, it's pretty handy to get. They actually drop one every cycle, but to make, say, to feed 20 duplicates like we were discussing before, you'd need to run 16 delectables, which is quite a bit. That, and these delectables do eat regolith. That's the problem. They still consume the same amount of regolith as before, which is about 4.8 tons per cycle. And meaning you're going to need 76 tons of regolith per cycle to keep feeding these to feed about 20 duplicates. Not really viable. As well as that, you can't actually trick them into regrowing their scales for free if you leave them wild. You can see it here, it must eat food between 70 degrees to minus 80 degrees to regrow sheared uh, tonic root. Meaning there's, there's no real way to get them to do it unless you're going to get regolith, cool it down and feed it to them directly. It's... Uh, uh, don't get me wrong, it's a fun addition, but it's going to be very niche. One last thing, this is fixed is the infinite starvation ranching of shovels. It used to be you could get shovels, stick like 20 of them in a room, then just starvation ranch them, as in you could keep grooming them but not feed them, and they'd still drop an egg before they ran out of calories. Unfortunately, it turns out that the delectable does not start with as many calories as a normal vole, which means they starve before they drop that one egg, which means starvation ranching shovels will slowly but surely degrade the numbers. So just something to look out for. Not the end of the world, I stopped starvation ranching a long time ago, but if you're still using one of those builds, it becomes far less viable now. That leads us on to hoax shells. 
Now the poke shells have received two mutations, and let's go through the worst one first. And that would be the oak shell morph. Now the oak shell morph is very similar to the poke shell in that it sheds its skin, but the skin it drops is actually this stuff up here. This is a small oak shell mold from a kid, and it dropped 50 kilos of wood. The uh, larger one, oh, that's not one of them, it drops 500 kilos, and it, I think they actually shed every so often, maybe, because this, there's, I'm finding these occasional 100 kilo patches around the place, though I could be wrong about that. Like, over here you'll see there's actually 100 kilos dropped on the ground, so I'm not sure where that's coming from. They might actually drop more than that, but if it's just the 50 kilos when they spawn and the 500 kilos when they die, that means you're getting about 550 kilos of wood every six cycles out of a one oak shell or one tamed oak shell. To put that in perspective, if you were just running one arbor tree, one arbor tree would generate around 333 kilos per cycle. One of these uh, wood oak shell things, they generate about 91 kilos per cycle. So they're, they're not nearly as good as trees and they do consume looted dirt, rot pile and slime at about 70 kilos a cycle. Up until now it was 140 kilos for all the poke shell variants, but now they've all been reduced to 70 for reasons that will become clear as we start going through this. As well as that, they only excrete 25% of the consumed mass as sand. All the other poke shell types, they all excrete 50% of the consumed mass as sand. So you end up with less sand, but more wood. This is a weird way to actually generate water in a way. You can take polluted dirt, feed it to them, and then you can turn that wood turn it into ethanol and then that gives you water in a way so there are a few niche scenarios where you might be trapped on an asteroid with no actual access to wood this is also a way to generate polluted dirt in a way but it's not infinitely renewable you only get about a third of the polluted dirt back out of what you put in as in if you take all the wood from these run it through an ethanol distillery the amount of polluted dirt you get out of the ethanol distillery will only repay about a third of the cost of running the oak shell from what i can see these are basically just a niche variant for trapped on an asteroid with minimal access to uh, resources then comes the sunny shell uh okay hey. Guys, would everyone get out of the way and stop trying to mob this sunny shell? Let our guys mob it instead. Sunny shell is, well, basically a fish in a way. And come on, drop dead. There we go. Nope, nope, don't, don't pick it up. Leave it, leave it. I want everyone to have a look at what's left over. Okay, so what you end up with is raw shellfish. It looks kind of like shrimp. But you get 4,000 calories. Now, I need to stress something here. You can take those 4,000 calories, you can throw them into a grill, and you'll see raw shellfish to cook seafood. It takes uh, 1,000 calories and gives you about 1,600. Meaning, you can take those 4,000, run this four times, and get yourself 6,400 calories. That's right, 6,400 calories. Put that into perspective, a normal stone hatch will give you about 4,000 calories. That means these sunny shells are about two, oh, two and a half times more efficient than running slicksters or hatches or most of the base variant of critters. It's Kind of crazy. That's an awful, awful, awful lot of meat. In fact, it makes them one of the best mid-game critters you can potentially get. Now, how do you create these things? Well, there's only one way. Put them in water. You can see this poke shell here. We've got its sunny, pinchy row chances up to 5%. So dwelling in water will just keep increasing those chances again and again and again. Now, it has to be at least 350 kilos. If you have them in 349 kilos, let's say, uh, it will not increase the chances. This is 349 kilos of ethanol, though. This is for if you want to get your hands on one of the oak pinch rows. You pinch row, you need to actually keep them in 350 kilos plus of ethanol and it will increase their chances. So you'll notice here, this poke shell, nothing happened to them. If we make a minor change, and by minor I mean we add one kilo of ethanol to the liquids, then when we go in here we can watch, you can see their pinch row chances are going up. And if we chop that down one kilo again, the moment we do that, it suddenly stops going up and it'll go down. That's the thing. Once it's actually out of the uh, required medium, its chances go down again. Meaning if you keep a poke shell standing around, they don't have a 2% chance of dropping anything. They either actively have to be in ethanol or in water to up their chances. Otherwise, they will all simply default back to 0-0. Zero, zero. And their chances, you'll have 100% chances of getting pinch a roll. So why was this done? Now, I'm not a psychic. I can't tell what the devs are thinking, but I think I can guess. If you look at these ethanol distillery tree here, it was normally pretty good. The problem was it gave you a whole bunch of polluted dirt and there was no real use for it. You could feed it to poke shells to get sand, but no one needed that much sand. As well as that, you could feed the poke shells for lime, but not a lot of people needed that much lime either. But now, now it gets really interesting. Now what you can do is you can feed about 11 sandy shells off the polluted dirt from four ethanol distilleries. Those four ethanol distilleries support 11 sandy shells. That will get you, well, 11 duplicates running entirely on cooked seafood. Now, one thing to note is Paku or raw shell shellfish all produce cooked seafood. It's considered the exact same item. And that comes with the radiation resistance buff on top of that, which is nice. Now, that's not broken, but what is broken is these things also produce car carbon dioxide. 
that carbon dioxide can be fed to slicksters. In fact, quite a few. It's, it's one of the main benefits of running ethanol distilleries. And when you burn the ethanol, it produces even more carbon dioxide. You can run, if you were just running these four ethanol distilleries and burning it in a petroleum generators, you'd have enough CO2 to feed about 80 slicksters. But we, we don't want the money. What we want instead is to run about 44 slicksters and take the seafood we're running from running the 11 sandy shells and we want to make surf and turf. And if we did that, we could support... Ooh, 43 duplicants fed entirely on surf and turf with all of them getting the radiation resistant aquatic diet buff on top of that to reduce to give them uh, increased radiation resistance all of that is insanely nice great food quality just beautiful and that's all off running these four ethanol distilleries combined with the 7.2 trees now here's the thing when you burn all that ethanol it actually produces polluted water there's a quick petroleum generator for you, and it produces 750 grams of polluted water for every two kilos of ethanol you put in. What's really interesting here, though, is what this works out as costs you about 54 kilos of water per cycle to keep running these four ethanol distilleries forever. Assuming you take the polluted water that uh, you get back from the ethanol and you sieve it with sand, which of which you're going to have absolutely gajillions of tons of this stuff. You're going to have so much sand you won't know what to do with it all. That means it's costing you 54 kilos of water a cycle to keep this whole system running, generating you maybe a little bit of excess power, but at the same time generating 43 duplicates worth of surf and turf, right? And all for 54 kilos of water a cycle, which to put in perspective, you could run about, oh, three bristle blossoms for that. So you could run three bristle blossoms, or you could feed 43 duplicates on surf and turf. I think that's a really good case for using the sunny shells in some runs. Like, especially on some of the maps you're going to end up on, this would just be a beautiful, beautiful way to play. I really like that addition, and it definitely, I will see a lot more people going towards the ethanol distilleries in the future. Now, the, uh, the oak shells, unfortunately, I can't say anything too amazing about them. Maybe there's something I'm missing here, but maybe it's a way to turn polluted dirt into wood and water, because you can technically do that. There's some places, like, say, Iki Ani here, that are just covered in tons and tons of polluted dirt. So if you get your hands on some of those shells, it might be nice. But the thing is, you have to go to space to do that. And if you do, there's there's probably better critters you could be bringing back. I can't really find a niche for the oak shells just yet, but uh, maybe in the future. This here is a clean water tank. And let's just say someone peed in it. Someone very prolific. Then what you can do is you can throw in one of these sandy shells. They do have an animation where they can clean the germs in water. Now, it's a, a little bit random, but it does mean that if you do end up with some germs in your clean water tank, you can throw in a sandy shell and they'll clean that in a reasonable time frame. There, it started its little dance. It's still this down a bit. And throw in the germ overlay. Oh god, that's too many germs. Never mind, we'll just hover over a piece of water. So this water here has 110,000 germs in it. And you can see that as they do their little dance, the germs are going down quite rapidly. 109, 108. I know this is clean water, so the germs would go down anyway, but this rapidly increases the rate at which they clean out the germs. Just means it's a nice way to clean out your your, polluted, your water tanks if you mess up in the early game. You notice here, it's much lower germ content than over here. Okay, yes, we may have used a little bit too many germs in this one. But if you do manage to have an accident in your clean water tank, this is just a nice way of cleaning it out. Or if you just want to clean your clean water, you can pour it in one side and then pump it out the other end. By the time it gets past all the sandy shells, it should be completely clean. One interesting thing to note is Tonicrude here says it relieves gassiness. Unfortunately, that's not true. I got a duplicate Devon here, they're flatulent. I locked them in, forced them to eat a whole bunch of the stuff, and yeah, they're, they're still flatulent. I don't know if it makes them less flatulent, but they're definitely still flatulent even after eating the curried beans. Oh, and the curried beans do give you a little bit of a buff that you get out of them. It's called the hot stuff buff. It gives plus three athletics, plus three strength. Unfortunately, it gives a bit of sneezing and stress. Now, it's the only food buff that you can get that gives you a plus to athletics, which would normally be great. It's just the difficulty of acquiring this and the sneezes and stuff. But they sneeze about oh, two or three times a day once they've got this. Uh, I, I still don't see a need for these curried beans. Plus, you're, to run them successfully, you would need to be have some regular harvesting set up. I think in the base game, that would work quite well. But in the, the DLCs, it's not really an option. Because in the DLCs, you'd, you'd have to actually go over to your asteroid planet, set up a base, harvest the regular, and probably run it right here. And then, well, the food's only there. It, it just, it seems for the DLC, not really that useful. Only for the base game would that be really useful because you've always got regolith on your starter map. Next up, we've got the Cuddle Pip. They are very similar to the regular Pip in that, well, they go and root around through things. They can plant stuff. In fact, they can do pretty much all the same things a regular Pip can do, but they do have a few bonuses on top of it and a couple of negatives. Negatives are they eat more. That's just about it. And they give you less dirt which usually you're not growing pips for, their, for dirt, you're usually using them to just wild plant stuff. So they're not terrible that way. However, they do have some other bonuses going on for them. Namely, they can cuddle eggs. Now this is, oh, let me see. So these pips here will run around and about 
once or twice a day, they'll go and try and hug an egg. And they will hug an egg whether it's in an incubator or not, and when they do that hugging, it gives it a buff. Basically the cuddle buff, which increases the, the egg's hatch rate by 100%, doubles the speed. So if an egg normally takes 20 cycles, instead it'll take 10. And it stacks on top of lullaby. It doesn't multiply it though, it just stacks. So in this instance, this egg is getting uh, increased changes per cycle is up to 20%. 3% for base, 3% for cuddled, 13% for lullaby. Well, that's a, that's a Dreco egg. If we take, say, a Sani Pincha, these ones are the exact same, by the way, as normal stone hatches, regular hatches, uh, slicksters, all that stuff. Gets up to 30%. Meaning you can hatch an egg instead of four cycles from a normal incubator, assuming you're getting them cuddled all the time, you can get them out in about, well, three and a third, which is, yeah, better, but I don't really see these things as being a huge game changer. They definitely help, and you can dump them into your, your egg areas to try and speed up the, the hatching of your eggs. Just not really sure it's that useful. Now, even though I said they only hug eggs about, or cuddle eggs two times a cycle, there is a chance to supercharge them. It's when they do this. They hop up and down and they start hoping for hugs. And the thing is, someone has to come along and actually hug, hug them. But it's not actually classified as a task, it just means a duplicate has to walk by. Uh, so for that instance, let's just say, oh yeah, you put in a hatchling egg and make that a enormous priority. And that should mean someone will run past here, and when they run past the cuddle pip, they should hug it. Seriously, someone... Guys, that's actually an emergency and none of you are going to show up? Uh, I'm kind of embarrassed. Oh yeah, here we go. And... Hey! And they give them a big hug. Okay, we'll reduce that to a level 5, that's grand. In fact, we can, we can cancel that entirely. There we go. And then after they've hugged it, they should get a little buff to them. They've got Ticketosis already, but now they've got hugged. The duplicate rec recently received a hug from a friendly critter. It was so fluffy. Effects, minus 5% stress for half a cycle, which is actually kind of handy. Not great, but it's a thing. Now this cuddle pip here now has hugging spree. This creature was recently hugged. While in the state, it hugs eggs more frequently. Effects, one cycle. So for the next cycle, it's just going to hug everything in sight. So if we were to, say, drop a few random eggs in there, there we go, a couple of, a couple of cuddle pip eggs. And they're also hugging the ones in the incubators. That's the incubator hugging animation. And then they should go along to hug, hug the ones on the ground also while they're at it. Anyone? Anyone want to hug the... Come on, it's an actual pip egg. Oh, there we go. They're hugging an egg on the ground. So they can cuddle an egg whether it's in an incubator or on the ground and increase its incubation rate. Still not seeing a massive use case for this. Don't get me wrong, it'd be handy for getting some wild eggs hugged or something like that. Maybe if you want to get wild eggs to hatch faster for some reason. I'm sure there'll be some niche uses for it, but in general purpose, I don't see this being a massive game changer. Not like, uh, not like Sani shells. They can become a staple of a lot of bases. These pips do not require a lot of space. This one is happy in four tiles of space. This one is unhappy in three, so is that you can stack quite a few of these in one room. I mean, theoretically, in a normal-sized ranch, you could just run 20 of these. And they could all live off an arbor tree, like a couple of wild-planted arbor trees, or maybe three or four, and you could just run 20 pips inside the ranch. And the reason you can't run more than that is because, well, you wouldn't be able to fit any more into the animal drop-off. Huh, interesting. Now, there were a bunch of other changes, like they included the refresh clothing refashionator. It allows you to take a normal snazzy suit and snazzy it up a little bit more to increase its decor levels. For example, this is Mellington here wearing uh, a cummerbund of some sort. Anyway, it doesn't actually do a huge amount, to be honest. If you go under the decor section here, you'll see it's giving a plus 40 decor, and it has the exact same radius as the snazzy suit. The snazzy suit gives plus 30. These new ones give plus 40. That's it. They all have a radius of three tiles as well. So three tiles either side of the duplicate also get a plus 30. So it just seems like a no-brainer later on in the game. You'd probably get every one, one of these, but it's more a case of you can make now nice snazzy suits for your duplicates and choose different colors and styles. And it's just more of a, for people who like to role play a bit or want to put their duplicates in like spiffy overalls or something like that. Your call. But overall view here, since they fixed the ranching bug, so that now people can gain experience, they also did a whole bunch of performance improvements, a lot of them targeted towards critter. critters. I think at the introduction of these extra critter morphs that really make the whole ethanol tree much more viable and running massive amounts of ranches, I think they're going to flesh out the whole ranching section so that it becomes far more viable, especially in late game bases, especially with the performance improvements they've kicked out. And as for the performance improvements themselves, yes, they're a thing. Even on my larger bases, I've noticed that, yes, I can get a lot more frames per second and everything feels a lot smoother. Now, let's be realistic here, that's not a massive game changer, it just means we're going to build bigger bases until we collapse them anyway. It's just, you know, it gives us a little bit more flexibility and a little bit more room before we have to get away from ranches. And while I know it's not a huge thing, at least having Nosh Sprouts be at least partially viable, assuming you start on an asteroid with the regolith, kind of gives them a niche use. I mean, it kind of works, and it, it, it also, since the Nosh Sprouts take ethanol, it's just fleshing out the ethanol tree even more. Anyway, that's a quick rundown of the most re relevant bits of the new patch. I uh, hope you enjoyed, and good luck.